are privileged to host this uh, very important uh, webinar. Uh, we take time to appreciate all those who have joined us. Uh, we, we don't take you for granted. We really appreciate your presence in this uh, webinar. And today we are going to look at a very interesting uh, subject that uh, deals with two twins. Uh, the two twins uh, being the sanitary and phytosanitary and the uh, technical barriers to trade agreements under the WTO. Now, we say they are twin uh, subjects uh, because they focus on the same uh, kind of uh, object. Uh, that is trade and the well-being of human uh, uh, well uh, being uh, used in a manner that uh, is supposed to ensure that while we are doing trade, uh, while we are developing, while we are engaged in uh, commercial activities, uh, the well-being of human life is self-guarded uh, in a number of perspectives. Now, the perspectives are what they differ, and the way they differ uh, does not make it impossible for the two to be dealt with uh, in one uh, product, uh, because the, ideal, the, the, the focus is always uh, the one uh, particular thing that we need to, to uh, facilitate trade, as well as ensuring that those who are dealing with the trade are also mindful of the welfare of the people involved, the cons both the consumers, the producers, and those who are doing the trade itself. So we are privileged to have a number of very experienced uh, uh, panelists who have been dealing with this subject from a number of uh, uh, institutions and perspectives, as well as for a number of years. Uh, I'm Ruben Kisore, uh, Technical Director, African Organization for Standardization. I'm stepping in in the moderation on behalf of Dr. Imogene Sengmana, uh, the Secretary General of the African Organization for Standardization. Uh, he will be in the background observing and perhaps taking into account any questions you might have that we may need to uh, address at a later stage. So. We are looking at this twin subject and they are based on negotiations that have taken place over a very long time from 1949 uh, with the first uh, achievements being at, uh, gained uh, from around 1979. So when the member states started these discussions, uh, they looked at issues of tariffs and tariffs, as usual, these are revenues that countries get from a trade. When you are importing, exporting, or trading, uh, the, the member states get uh, the, the, the revenues from the taxes and duties. Uh, but that is easy to, to resolve. And once it is resolved, it is not repeated over and over again. The issues that keep being repeated are those that deal with uh, the technical aspects of the products that we deal with, as well as the sanitary and phytosanitary aspects of the, of the products that we're dealing with. While it is also very easy to establish standards for manufactured products, for instance, if it is talking about textbooks, you're talking about books, you're talking about um, construction materials, it's very easy to get the standards that uh, prescribe the dimensions, the safety aspects and everything else. But also, when now you are dealing with products that are consumed by human beings, that's where the sanitary and phytosanitary measures come in. So once the TBT agreement was done, then it was realized by a number of countries that the issues of standards and the code of practice that deals with the standards did not very well articulate issues to do with the agricultural products and food products as such. And therefore, there was need for a separate agreement to be done. Now, this separate agreement was to focus on these agricultural products and food products, uh, which look at the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that safeguard not only the human life, but also looking at ensuring that in the course of this trade, uh, you do not have transfer of a plant and animal diseases and their cause and uh, agents 
uh, from one member state to the other. And that is the essence of the SPS agreement. So when you are looking at this, there is always the products that have those both perspectives, uh, the technical barrier structure as well as they also have an aspect of uh, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures. So how do you handle this? And this is the, cons the, the perspective that we are going to be dealing with uh, in this particular uh, webinar. In our continent, in Africa, you realize that agro-processing or trade in agriculture and food products is one of the, the topmost priorities. Now, to ensure that these two agreements, which are replicated in our African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, these two agreements do not create barriers that will block us from doing trade. And increasing intra-African trade is one of the objectives of the FCFTA agreement. So then how do you deal with it? And this is what we are trying to deal with, that we need to address uh, the issues that look at how are they handled. We understand that the institutions responsible work differently. They work in with the, actually within the same government, but they are in different ministries. The aligned ministries are different. But then if you are dealing with this and we are going to increase trade, we need to address uh, the interface between this, um, uh, these agreements. How do we do that? And therefore, it is important that uh, in the webinar that we are going to have today, we deal with this subject. We look at the various perspectives. We hear from the various uh, panelists who have experience in their own sphere of uh, work and our colleagues, for, for example, from the WTO, our colleague from uh, CARICOM uh, will be presenting on their experiences. And then from there, we chat our way forward to understand how do we handle the subject so, such that we are able uh, to, to reach a point of convergence that we can promote trade, we can promote development as well, and ensure that we are able to maintain uh, the objectives of protecting human uh, animal or plant health and human health and at the same time ensuring that this you know the safety for the consumers and everybody else and the proceed with the trade are happening so in this implementation uh, you, you recall that the wto we have two committees the sps and tbt committees uh, which provide a forum for collaboration among the countries and in this sense, at the same time, at the continental level uh, in Africa, we do also have the same. Now, this is also cascaded down to the national level where you find this an SPS committee as well as the Certificate Committee. And when we look at the current study that was conducted by the FCFTA Secretariat, though not yet published, you realize that the responsible authorities for notification are different. So that area is fragmented. And that doesn't serve us very well. So how do we then move forward? The WTO has started what we call the EPING uh, uh, platform, uh, which was developed by the UN, WTO, and ITC as a free online tool that provides for update of information. For example, if there are changes at the national level and member states want to notify uh, the kind of measures they are put in place, they're able to communicate to the widest uh, audience across the world. Is this going to be useful uh, at the continental level? Is this going to be something that we can replicate? Uh, is this going to be something that helps us to move forward? You need to look at the two agreements on the side by side. Just hold on a bit uh, from that. On the side by side, you'll see the requirements of the TBT. Well, you see the requirements also on the SPS uh, agreement. What does it entail? When you have one particular product of then you need to be capable of handling this. Because if you are not capable of handling this, then it means we shall be having problems in trade. And that's not what we really intend to have. Let's move forward. Forward. Move the slide forward, please. So um, these are the, some of the things that we are going, we are going to do. and. Uh, 
one of the things that I think we've done at the continental level is to check our readiness uh, to handle the subject uh, through the stock, head, stock taking. And as you can see, you find that uh, handling SPS and other issues uh, at the national level, the infrastructure is not well developed. And for that matter, then it means that we need uh, to work harder to ensure that we can actually ensure that this is done. So in this webinar, we shall be looking at more developments. We shall be getting more insights and understanding uh, how uh, we, we, we collaborate uh, to ensure that we can have uh, the continent trading in both uh, those goods that fall under the TBT and those that fall under the SPS agreements, or those that need that interface uh, to work together. I move forward. We can move. So today's uh, hosting is done uh, by the Secretary General and uh, I stand in for him. Uh, he's uh, going to be observing the uh, events as they unfold. Uh, so uh, the Secretary General is uh, well experienced in the issues of uh, trade, uh, as well as the, inf uh, the quality infrastructure and has uh, qualifications in analytical and environmental chemistry and as well as having done, uh, having been at the peak, the, the peak of heading the gold infrastructure, particularly at the ASO level uh, for a long time. Uh, we shall be having, um, can move, uh, for the panelists that we shall be having, we have um, Margaret Lungu, a device of gold infrastructure at the AU and PAKI. Um, we will introduce them in detail uh, as we move forward. But may I take this opportunity to introduce Margaret uh, uh, Lulu, who will be our first panelist. Uh, she's an advisor of the quality infrastructure at the AU and PAKI. And she has served as director of technical services at the uh, Zambia Bureau of Standards and the regional coordinator for the Southern African Development Community in Standardization, SADC STAN. And under SADC STAN, uh, technical barriers to trade the SADC activity program. Uh, she has been with Park Secretariat since 2021. 20, uh, uh, she holds a, a master's degree in food, degree in food science uh, from Leeds University in the UK, and a bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology from the University of Zambia. Uh, she will be looking or giving us a presentation on categorization of the SPS and TBT measures and the challenges of the variant African re regional economic community regulatory policies uh, to the intra African trade. Uh, PAKI Common Regulatory Framework Initiatives and the PAKI SPS and TBT stock taking on the current status of SPC, uh, SPS and TBT's endowment in Africa. Margaret, you are welcome as the, our first panelist. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Gisore, and thank you for the invitation to be on this panel to represent PAKI. So as it has been shared, I will be making a short presentation on the initiative that PAKI has undertaken or is still undertaking uh, with regards to um, improving or making its contribution towards the uh, intra-Africa trade. Um, I'm trying to move my slide. Okay. So for starters, I think there is commitment for economic integration at the highest level, as we all know, in Africa. And this is very clearly stated in the 1991 uh, Abuja Treaty, which established the African Economic Community. And the beauty about this treaty is that it recognizes the importance of quality infrastructure in economic development. 
I think for PACI, which deals with quite infrastructure issues, this is very, very important. And it gives it the drive to do the work that it does. Uh, specifically, Article 67, it lays out very clearly the need for a common policy on standardization and measurement. Of course, this is a 1991 treaty. And so many years later in 2022, or is it 2021, we have a quality, uh, we have an Africa quality policy on standardization and measurement systems, of course, including accreditation and others in, in that uh, field. It has come late, but nonetheless, it is there now in line with the, the treaty. And uh, of course, PACI draws its inspiration from, from that treaty to carry out its work. And um, indeed, PACI is a platform that discuss matters relating to standardization, accreditation, and metrology. And basically, it discusses cross cutting issues as PACI. It comprises four pillars which operate independently, like ARSO, who is hosting us today for this webinar, has its mandate to look at matters of standards, together with AFSEC, its sister, except AFSEC looks at the electrotechnical field, standards in the electrotechnical field. We have AFRAC, which looks at matters of accreditation, and AFRIMATES Afri looks at metrology, the science of measurements. But together, they do recognize that one cannot fulfill all the quality requirements operating on their own. They need to collaborate. They need to work together. I think just like Mr. Gisore said in his introduction, the two TBT and SPS overlap. And therefore, even the institutions that deal with those areas, it means their their works also overlap. So these are the four institutions that form the PACI uh, Joint Committee, and together they discuss cross-cutting issues. The objective of the PACI, there are several objectives, I must say, but I only picked on these two because I think they speak directly to what uh, we are discussing today. The first one is to promote the development of a coherent Pan-African quality infrastructure. We know that in our own countries, we have institutions who are running with activities that relate to SPS, activities that relate to TBT. And we are also aware that sometimes activities overlap and we point fingers at each other, arguing that this is my area, that is not your area, you are not supposed to play in this field. That does not help the private sector, it does not help with the integration at the domestic level. So we find that the one who suffers most is actually the private sector who is regulated to run their business. And so PACI is actually running with activities to ensure there's coherence at the level of the continent, but of course, taking recognition that all this starts at national level. So at national level, if there's coherence, there definitely will be coherence even at um, regional and at continental level. The other objective, of course, is to strengthen the development and implementation of African policies. Yes, I just mentioned the Africa quality policy that was developed. And it needs to be implemented. And so there has to be programs to ensure that it is uh, implemented effectively and efficiently. And I'll speak to that as we move on. So today we are talking about TBT and SPS measures, and I think Mr. Gisori has already explained and given us what these uh, measures are. 
So SPS measures, of course, they focus on the protection of plant health, animal health, and food safety. And this area is regulated. And there are no two ways about it. TBT, on the other hand, are very broad. They will cover, in addition to what some of the SPS measures are covered, TBT measures cover also quality, safety, protection of the environment, labeling, packaging, name it. And uh, all these requirements of SPS, of TBT measures, the only way to monitor their effectiveness is through testing, certification, monitoring, and so on and so forth. And the activities of quality infrastructure institutions play a very, very important role in ensuring that these are, first of all, implemented adequately. They are also developed in the right manner and applied in the right manner as well. So these requirements, of course, can be prescribed in voluntary standards for TBTs or taken co-regulations. And of course, if they are taken co-regulation, they, they are mandatory and whoever is playing in that field has to comply with the requirements of those taken co-regulations. But what is of key interest to PAKI is that uh, institutions that are responsible or that provide services like testing, like certification or accreditation, development of standards, they need to be at a certain level. And so PAKI needed to know where are we on the continent with regards to development, the level of development in the quality infrastructure, but also in the SPS systems. And so they came up with an exercise what we are calling the stock taking exercise. Because it is very clear that the level of development of QI services and SPS systems have a great impact on how these TBT and SPS measures are addressed. They also impact on the support that is given in the value chains that are um, that the businesses are involved in. Because if you are well developed, you will better assist, for example, a farmer who is a, uh, keeping animals or a farmer who is growing um, natural products, vegetables, and things like that, you'll be able to assist them from the beginning until the end. So that with your assistance, they will be able to meet the SPS measures that may be in place either at national level or at international level. A well-developed system does give confidence to importing countries. And of course, if it is not well-developed, the opposite is also true. No one will have confidence in the products coming from a, a, a country whose systems are not well-implemented or are not well-established. So Paki took the initiative to carry out the exercises and I must say for TBTs, four publications actually are now in place, which shows the progression in terms of development of quality infrastructure institutions or systems in Africa. The latest version of the TBT publication is uh, 2023. Yeah, this so it was published and launched last year. And you can clearly see the progress that has been made in terms of development of the TBT or quality infrastructure institutions. Uh, regarding the SPS, uh, Paki has only done two exercises. And of course, in two years, the first one was published in 2020. And uh, of course, systems take time to develop and results take time to show. So we have not seen significant difference between the 2020 and the 2022 version. But the important thing is that the PACI is actually monitoring how well countries are improving in this area. 
but also of utmost importance that these documents provide information to policymakers, to technical assistance institutions, to direct uh, resources where they are needed the most. So when you look at the map or when you receive these documents and you see where you are, you will see where you are weak. And of course, then the government can direct resources to those weak areas so that you can actually make improvements. Uh, the, the documents are very easy to read because they are color coded. The results are color uh, in color. So these are just examples of the, this is the quality infrastructure activity stock taking report. Uh, this one here is the, the SPS stock taking report. So the, the results are presented in color. And uh, if you recall, Mr. Ruben also showed us a map. So the green, the dark green indicates that you have a well-developed system. And then the lighter green, it is reasonable. The yellowish orange it means it's there, but limited in capacity. And of course, the red, it means that it is very limited. But at the same time, I think as a continent, I am not sure we want to be labeled as well developed or just reasonable. So that uh, when you see green, it doesn't mean that we need to relax. There's still a lot of scope to work in. But also this is the overall grade. And then each, each particular field or element that is uh, assessed is also graded. And you may find that even if you are in the green zone, there may be areas that may be in the limited zone. So it is important to always look at these documents, see where you are weak and make improvements. But even where you think you are strong, because you don't want to remain at the level of where well, I suppose you want to be the best, it means there's always room for improvement. Regarding the areas that are, are looked at, for SPS, of course, we are looking at the notification authorities and the, the inquiry points. And Mr. Rubin talked about the inquiry points, which are all over the show and the information is not uh, clearly communicated, it is scattered. So we look at that. We look at the food safety system, the plant health, system and the animal health systems. For TBTs, we look at the inquiry point again, we look at standardization, accreditation, and meteorology services. So we look at the specific questions that we ask and the, those the resources are collected and analyzed, and then we come up with the results. Uh, these documents are available at the PACI website, www.paki.org. Free of charge, you can download and, and read them and you'll get more information. They will help you identify where you need to focus on in terms of making some improvements so you can better support implementation and development of TPT and SPS measures in your country but also most importantly, so that you are also able to support the private sector. With regards to policy documents, Paki has also done, uh, worked on two key policy documents. Fairly new, we have the Africa Quality Policy, which was uh, adopted in 2021 by the AUC. And this policy highlights the institutional, structural, and collaboration requirements for a robust quality infrastructure landscape. It directs how an effective quality infrastructure system is developed and sustained. But it also enables the quality infrastructure to continually operate in a coherent and effective manner while meeting international requirements. So I already indicated that we have institutions in our countries who tend to operate in silos. They work on their own 
and they when they meet in certain areas they begin to fight over who is responsible for this area and then at the same time there are certain areas that are are left unattended to because one institution thinks the other one is looking at it. And so a policy enables to close up all those areas if it is properly implemented, of course. It helps to identify where the gaps are, what are the lacunas, where are the overlaps, and then how best to deal with those overlaps. So the policy, this Africa Quiet Policy actually addresses seven, seven functions. And what we are asking for from the party side now is for member states to actually align their national quality policies to the Africa quality policy. We know that they will not be the same, and we are not asking for the for the NQPs to be exactly as the AQP, no. But I think what is of utmost importance is to address the different elements but also to understand the operations, the, the local operations at national level, how are things running and how well can you knit them together so that they can actually meet the objectives. That will help in the harmonization of private infrastructure activities. And it will also make it easier for the private sector to conform with requirements and ultimately to participate in global trade. I'm sure you are aware that ASO harmonizes standards, AFSEC harmonizes standards, and then the others also are looking at harmonizing their metrol recalibration activities and things like that. But if our quality infrastructure institutions operate in an incoherent manner, I think it will be it becomes very difficult to agree when you are trying to harmonize. Uh, these activities. So we have a policy, and the beauty is that this policy, of course, is, has been adopted at African Union level, and the African Union Commission actually has established a council that will be responsible, or that is responsible for the implement to oversee the implementation of this policy. So it is in place at the AUC in the trade department. And then uh, the police also recommends the establishment of a continental technical regulatory framework. And this is because we are aware that uh, it is not only voluntary standards or voluntary activities that um, impact trade, but also technical regulations. They also impact trade. And so uh, this ACTREF document has actually been developed so that uh, it can provide principles and policies to basically minimize uh, technical barriers to trade, to avoid creating unnecessary obstacles. You know, so it, it's, it's just a framework it has uh, principles, and uh, some of which are based on the WTO. And it's basically looking at uh, regulatory convergence. Yeah. So just like we are talking about co cooperating, working together, and so that we can easily harmonize standards, also in the regulatory framework, where we are using technical regulation, we are saying, can we have a guide? This is a guidance document actually that will help our member states to develop technical regulations in a manner that obstacles to trade will be minimized. It does not stop member states to develop technical regulations because we understand that uh, every country has a sovereign right, sovereign right to protect its people by developing technical regulations. But the important thing is that the technical regulations should be developed and applied in a manner that does not create obstacles to trade. And I think more information will be shared through the other panelists on how you need to share what you are working on so the other countries can also make comments to that.
but also to effectively implement this um, document, there will be need for countries or member states to actually put in place national technical regulatory frameworks. Yeah, so the, 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 these the national technical regulatory frameworks will actually assist also member states to deal with the overlaps, to deal with the fights on who is responsible for which sector, so that all those things are actually dealt with once these uh, national technical regulatory frameworks are developed. And the core really is that these should be aligned to the, taking the continental technical regulatory framework so that when we are talking about uh, um, technical regulations or harmonizing the objectives of the technical regulations, it will be much easier for us to carry out that work. And also to note is that uh, the document applies to other sectors as well, not just trade. So it can apply to the pharmaceutical sector, basically anywhere where technical regulations are being developed. So the principle of developing the technical regulation, basically we are saying it should be the same as that for developing technical regulations that have impact on trade. Also, what is also very important is that um, we can easily reach convergence if we focus on adopting or referencing international standards or African standards in the technical regulations. And of course, there's a whole chain of activities that has been lined up by party in order to see how best to implement this and assist national, uh, the member states on how to actually develop the NATREF that is aligned to the ATREF, but also learn about how to make reference to, to reference international standards or the African standard developed by ASO and AFSEC in the technical regulations. Of course, for us on AFSEC, we are aware, I'm sure you're also aware that in Africa, we have our own unique products. So there will be standards that are focused on purely African products. And therefore, there may not be any international standard. And so the African standards definitely will work in those areas. The other initiative that PAC is working on to improve and support trade is a mutual recognition framework for conformity assessment results. Of course, this work and all these other works that I've talked about, PAC has been working in collaboration with the African Union Commission as well as the AFCFTA Secretariat. So they are also part and parcel of these initiatives. But also just to say that when we work on these documents, member states are always consulted and they provide their input. So from the party side, this is what is happening, carrying out assessment of the QI framework to see where we are, and then to give guidance to policymakers and technical assistance programs to direct resources where need is but also now we have the African quality policy guiding on how the national quality policy should be developed in order to have a coherent and effective QI system on the continent. And we now also have this continental technical regulatory framework uh, to help in minimizing obstacles to trade. Uh, thank you very much. This is all I had to share in this short time. I hope I have been clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, a quick one, because I think you have answered quite a, a, a number of the questions that we needed to have. Now, it, this is an error that we can co-locate some of these inquiry notification points. Uh, and for Africa, this can be a start that can really help a lot. So what would prevent or what is the possibility that we can co-locate the SPS and uh, TBT notification, as well as inquiry offices, 
so that we do not have this fragmented, uh, you know, location and issuance of uh, conflicting, sometimes conflicting uh, notifications and giving out information that is incoherent. Can we co-locate this inquiry and notification points so that we have a coherent system that helps the people involved in trade or the stakeholders to get the information from one point? Is it possible? Uh, thank you very much for, for that question, Ruben. I, I think it is very, very possible. But the first thing is, uh, is for the domestic at, at the national level to have a good system, to have a system that communicates properly. So if, if the system communicates well, it is very easy to actually have uh, the, not, the SPS and the TBT notification under one roof. Because uh, then you can have systems at the national level that speak to one another. I mean, on the other hand, TPT and SPS measures do not affect one institution or one individual. You always have to consult. Yeah. So when you consult, come up with a resolution and then channel it to one, one, one notification point, then as a nation, you will all be speaking one language. Besides, both affect trade. So, and we are all interested in ensuring that uh, trade runs smoothly. Yeah, so thank you very much. Something that is possible, but we need to have a good system of communication at national level. Thank you. Thank you. That we can achieve. We are in an era of information technology, and I believe that it is possible to actually do this. Uh, we thank you very much, and I think hold a bit because we sh shall be coming back to you uh, as we move forward. I would like to in invite the next panelist. Um, our next panelist is Sarah L. Uh, Sarah is uh, working with the uh, is a counselor at the, the trade and development division of the WTO. Her current work focuses on uh, the relationship between standards, regulations, and trade. Uh, that's very interesting, and we need to focus on that very well. As secretary of the WTO Technical Barriers to Trade Committee and its uh, Transparency Working Group, she advises and supports member governments with respect to the engagement. She's currently speaking on initiatives focusing on transparency, including the Transparent uh, Championship, Championship Program and the Eping SPS and TBT platform. Uh, serves and connects public and private sector stakeholders in tracking regulations affecting international trade. Early assignment uh, in the WTO focused on sanitary and financial standard measures, a regional trade agreement and capacity building. Prior to joining the WTO, she worked at the World Bank, the World Economic Forum. Originally from Texas, as the economics from Mount Hillyoke uh, College and a master's and international relations from John Hopkins uh, University all over the international relations, international body. Uh, we welcome you and we would like to really hear uh, what initiatives you're working on to ensure that Sarah, you're welcome. I can see you are muted. You can unmute yourself, please. Not yet. Hello? 
Yes, can you, you can hear yeah? me? Okay, thank you. The system wouldn't allow me unmute uh, to unmute myself. I think I needed some technical uh, intervention and it seems to work now. Is that okay. so? Okay. Go ahead, Oof, thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to join this webinar and present uh, some of the ongoing work um, under the WTO's uh, SPS and TBT committees related to the implementation of the SPS and TBT agreements. Um, I was asked to provide a brief intervention of about five to 10 minutes with five slides. So I will keep it relatively general and uh, hope that through questions, we can go into certain details uh, as, uh, which are of interest to this group. Uh, and um, I also wanted to highlight, of course, that a lot of the issues that are also on my slides have already been uh, mentioned. So I may go faster on some of them. So let me see now the next challenge uh, is to share my screen and let's see if that works. Um, yeah, you can see it. Just put in present presentation mode. Is it now in presentation mode? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. So. Um, well, I was talk, asked to talk about um, the SPS and TBT agreements and mainly the transparency elements uh, in them. So just to recall, this has been raised uh, also already, but why, when we look at why we have these two agreements and why they may be important, I want to refer to um, one of uh, the recent publications of our colleagues at UNCTAD which looks quantitatively at the impact or tries to look more quantitatively at the impact of regulations. Um, and um, here they have, um, for example, in this study, they have identified that technical regulations are the most frequent form of non-tariff measures affecting 40% of product lines and about 70% of world imports. And when we talk about agri-food imports, in agri -food food sector, it's the SPS measures which are most frequent. So these regulations covered by the SPS and TBT agreements have significant impact on trade. Of course, they bring benefits because they are there to reach certain policy objectives, but they also have costs. And the um, question is, how can we make sure that um, these we can draw on the benefits of regulations without making them unnecessarily costly? And it's also important to recall that when we talk about tariffs and uh, at the introduction, we heard about the story of the tariffs and the in increasing prevalence of uh, NTMs, that if you have tariffs, uh, if it's a 10% tariff rate uh, or 100%, if you pay the rate, you are in. But with regulations, uh, there's no market entry normally without compliance. So, and since this is an evolving area, you see, as you, I will show you every day, you hear of new regulations popping up in different parts of the world, including in Africa, of course. Um, how do you keep track and how do you um, prepare yourself? So um, the SPS and TBT agreements try to establish a framework for these regulations that are needed uh, for certain objectives. And as you've seen in our various presentation, and I think this was also in the concept note, there's an attempt to strike a balance between allowing members regulatory autonomy to fulfill legitimate objectives, as we call under the TBT agreement, or to protect human, animal, plant, life, or health, as it's said in the SPS agreement. While doing so to avoid uh, discriminatory or unnecessary barriers to international trade to avoid unnecessary costs so that trade can be facilitated. And here, um, there are a number of principles to be followed. And one of them, a key one is transparency, uh, which we will talk about a bit more in detail. Another one is the importance of adherence to international standards where available, where relevant. So I will now talk a little bit a bit more about transparency 
and how it facilitates can't facilitate timely access to regulatory developments through the notifications in the case of the WTO system, how it can bring predictability, how it can allow stakeholder engagement, promote regulatory cooperation and reduce trade costs and overall build trust, trust among trading uh, nations. There are a series of um, transparency obligations and procedures under the SPS and TBT agreements, and they're very similar, actually, they're with some differences. And the one I just want to highlight here is, um, due to shortage of time also, is the notification of SPS and TBT measures as they're being drafted, when there's a draft, and to allow a comment period of 60 days. And this applies to all members of the WTO, including all members from Africa. And if we look at the trends over the years since 1995, we see an increasing number of notifications being submitted to the WTO on usually upcoming regulations. Sometimes when, there, when there's an emergency situation, um, these notifications are also um, submitted uh, after adoption of a measure. But last year, uh, we had more than 6,000 of these notifications circulated. It's And there are a number of reasons for this increase. Of course, there's more regulatory activity, but at least as important, probably more important, is the increased engagement from more and more developing countries and LDCs. And a very good for example, is members of the East African community, which are among the top notifiers, um, especially under the TBT agreement, but also under SPS agreement. And they also work together to notify together and provide a comment period together. So they really have set, they have really set um, a, an amazing example for how to coordinate at the national and regional levels to be able to comply with their obligations. But of course, one side of the coin is compliance and the other is to be able to benefit from all the information that is being, uh, that is being circulated, that is available in theory to everyone because all this information is publicly available. And of course, just to remember that these uh, notifications of upcoming regulations normally cover a wide range of products. It can be about um, you know, uh, toys and uh, protecting children from small pieces or toxic materials. It can be about chemicals, labeling of textiles, pesticide residue in bananas, pl um, plant health risks from timber uh, exports or um, efficiency requirements for cars uh, and so on. Uh, and just to recall, as was also mentioned, there are a number of other entities which play a key role in ensuring the preparation of notifications through national coordination and sometimes not regional. And these are usually inquiry points and or notification authorities who are tasked with this. Uh, usually the two entities can be the same, but sometimes different. And there are also other pub obligations like obligation to publish the final version of all your regulations in an accessible manner. And over the years, the committee's practices have evolved um, on SPS and TBT side on how to do this. And I should also note here that under the FCFTA annexes, um, the, they refer to the transparency obligations under the WTO agreements, and also note that any subsequent uh, recommendations and changes should also be incorporated. So importance of following, I think, uh, what is going on at the multilateral level. I should also emphasize that um, there was recently a ministerial conference, MC13, uh, of the WTO in Abu Dhabi, and there was a declaration on strengthening regulatory cooperation to reduce technical barriers to trade. And there was a very strong emphasis on transparency and its key role in avoiding trade frictions and facilitating trade. Now, 
you just saw the vast number of notifications that are being circulated. <clears throat> now, how does eping help? Uh, first of all, there was some talk about sort of different silos and um, work in SPS, work in TBT, maybe under TBT, under the inquiry point, different regulatory agencies, same for SPS. So one thing we have done at the WTO is we were also working in silos. We had different mechanisms for SPS, uh, different tools and different work TBT. So now since 2022, we have at the WTO through quite some pain and also sometimes you know debates managed to merge all our we had five systems into one and this is eping where you can uh, for a start search among all the notifications that are coming through and sometimes these notifications are subject of trade concerns raised in SPS and TBT committees Sometimes there are also other concerns raised independent of notifications. You can search those. And you can also receive customized alerts on markets and products of interest to you if you register. So it really um, is a publicly available for public and private sector. And it uh, also has a number of communication functions at the national and international level to connect uh, stakeholders. Just to give you an illustration of how it can help, basically each WTO member, including all members from Africa, <clears throat> use EPIC to submit their notifications regarding their SPS or TBT regulations or conformity assessment procedures. These come through the WTO, so SPS and TBT committees, and they are disseminated uh, via EPIC. At the same time, to the inquiry points, producers and exporters, other government agencies, sector associations, other interested parties. And the idea is domestic stakeholders can share feedback with each other. Either they may have to, let's say, adapt to a new labeling requirement, or maybe there's further questions on the measure and it's not clear, or maybe there are concerns. So they can do this either through EPING or their national committees, sometimes regional committees. And then the inquiry point can compile this feedback, submit usually within a 60 day to the notifying member, or sometimes there are trade concerns raised. So this is basically a little schema of how this transparency framework um, can operate for you. And finally, I just wanted to highlight that um, there is um, a Transparency Champions program, which we have launched at the WTO. It aims to scale up the application and benefits of WTO's transparency mechanisms. There was a pilot for a first pilot for African countries, and we've had quite some positive outcomes in terms of more notifications coming through, more coordination uh, efforts at the national and regional levels, and also more registrations on EPIM. And this was also very much aligned with the AFCFTA objectives, actually, in terms as uh, under the annexes, there's also obligations to track what's happening <laughs> at the WTO and um, also, adapt, uh, also take on the transparency procedures um, and uh, just I just shared, this is the TBT one. There was also an SPS one, and we concluded the TBT one in Nairobi last year. And uh, depending on interest, we're intending to continue such initiatives. So I think I'll stop there, just give you a little overview of some of our activities and trends, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I think I recall uh, this workshop in Nairobi. Uh, yes. I did not see through. I didn't sit through it, but uh, a very good initiative. And I think uh, we need more of this to really put the point uh, down that if we are going to trade, we need to understand how we communicate in a very transparent manner. Uh, it's not unheard of if I may say that uh, sometimes 
you uh, you, you know you assess you think your products are complying with a member state's requirements only for you to reach the board and find that you needed to do something more and it is too late to do that so um that level of transparency cannot be underrated it is something that is very important that we need to know it's it's not like it's a secret uh, we, if you are, you need to trade you need to actually be very transparent on what are the applicable um, measures in your country, whether they are TBT or the SPS. And this now brings me to the question. Uh, for our members to understand, and this is not a test, just take, for example, it is uh, cocoa powder. It has been processed, so it's processed. Of course, we know the origin is from the, the tree that uh, it grows in, it is picked, it is processed. What would be the most um, outstanding measures that we look at in that respect? Is it SPS or it is TBT, cocoa powder? Yes, okay, all right. Uh, now, as usual, I will say it depends, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's true that um, Sometimes it is easier to identify um, if it's the SPS or TBT agreement that applies to a measure. But when we mm -hmm. especially talk about food products, agriculture products, it becomes mm -hmm. uh, less clear. And okay. just first of all, generally to say that um, for the definition of an SPS measure, the best place to look is the annex of annex A of the annex one of the SPS agreement which mm -hmm. defines very specifically what is covered by the SPS agreement and is briefly food safety, animal health, and plant health. Uh, and usually we say, if you're looking at a regulation and if it doesn't fit in the definition in the SPS agreement, it's probably covered by the TBT agreement, although there could be questions. So if you're looking at cocoa powder, I would say if there could be a number of issues out there but for example if you're looking at contaminants in there well, for example yes. in the production site there were contaminants which could when the cocoa powder is eventually consumed by humans could yes. pose risks um, through the food safety angle that would be SPS yes. but yes. let's say it's cocoa powder and you need to have labels on it in terms of its nutrient qualities and mm -hmm. also in terms of uh, preparation, for example, uh, yes. or how to store it for quality. So if those are the issues like labeling or nutrient content, uh, mm -hmm. then it would be TBT. Usually we say safety for food is issues are uh, SPS and quality issues are TBT, although sometimes there's a gray area and even today yes. in our SPS and TBT committees sometimes one member will notify a measure under one agreement because if if let's say there's a measure on cocoa powder with the all the things I have mentioned ideally the member let's say imposing a measure has to notify it under both committees uh, yes, okay. so you, Whereas the private sector doesn't care, so they need to track both SPS and TBT to know the totality. But the discussions, depending on coverage, take place in the different bodies. So um, normally it would such a measure, let's say, would be not, need to notify under both. But and that's why it's also good to know. And then if there are questions, if it's on the food safety angle, it's usually the SPS inquiry point let's say you would have to answer if it's the quality tbt inquiry but of course behind them are the regulatory bodies sometimes it's the same regulatory body and sometimes it's not so it all depends also at the national level how uh, agencies are organized i don't know if that created more confusion or <laughs> no it's it's clear i think for us it is clear that's why we're emphasizing that uh, these bodies need to have dialogue. They need to be having a place where they converge and agree that, yes, as you said, this is an issue to do with contaminants, microbiological limits or whatever. This is SPS. Uh, this is an issue to do with labeling. This is an issue to do with the ingredients. 
TBT takes it. So we need to organize and notify at the same time on the same product, those measures, so that it is clear and transparent to, to the business community that, yes, if you're exporting, you've met this. If you're importing, then you have met this. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we mm -hmm. shall be coming back to you uh, on more issues as, as we move forward. And I think as it becomes more clearer uh, what we need to do, uh, we thank you very much. And we wish that championship continues and the issues, we shall be coming back on the transparency issues uh, more and more because we know we realize that it is very critical for our continent. Uh, thank you um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, if we may go, I think when are you are now uh, next? Quena, please come on. Um, I will introduce Quena. Um, uh, I, as we agreed, she will come in before the others because she's moving, uh, uh, she's having some uh, trip. So the role of SPS and TBT agreements uh, on uh, and committees in reducing technical barriers to trade, benchmarking with African Union, SPS and TBT subcommittees and the FCFT agreement. So Puena is an ex, uh, a senior expert uh, and NTBs, TBT, trade and goods and competition of the, uh, the African uh, Continental Free Trade Area um, Secretariat. Puena uh, is a program management uh, officer at UNCTAD, uh, but is a, is a second uh, to the FCFTA uh, Secretariat. So she's the program manager at the UNCTAD, and she currently seconded to the FCFT Secretariat, a senior expert on non-tariff barriers and technical barriers to trade. Uh, she's responsible for the implementation of annexes five and six of the FCFT agreement uh, with respect to uh, the agreement on uh, the protocol on trading goods. So she worked as an expert on standardization, world assurance, accreditation methodology for the SADEC Secretariat, monitoring technical barriers to trade and dis discriminatory uh, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers. So she holds a master's uh, of engineering degree in quality management from RMT uh, University in Australia, and a bachelor of science uh, from the university, National University of Lesotho. Uh, you have a very wide experience at, in the continent, Kuena, so that is not uh, to be um, overemphasized, and we really would want to hear more from the study to respect uh, to the implementation of the TBT uh, Annex 6 and Annex, uh, SPS Annex 7 of the FCFTA Secretariat. Welcome, Maya Quina, uh, for the presentation. Okay, I I was uh I was muted. I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, okay. But thank you very much. I hope that um the internet will last me. It's it's been very bad, going on and off. But I hope uh, with what we have, I can um briefly just go into my uh presentation. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, not go into the details. Uh, I'll just uh, um, say thank you very much uh, to uh, so for the invitation uh, to this uh, debate. Um, as has already been said, uh, I am responsible in the uh, AFCFK Secretariat for implementation of Annex 6 on the non-tariff barrier, um, on the technical barriers to trade, and also um, annex, uh, 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 on annex five on non-tariff barriers. Um, we also uh, are responsible within the division, even though not directly responsible for the sanitary and phytosanitary uh, annex uh, seven. Now, I think uh, a few things I will highlight before I go is uh, the fact that um, the TBT annex, um, I'll start with the TBT annex, uh, is um, uh, 
uh, a mirror really mirrors uh, the WTO TBT uh, annex, uh, TBT agreement, and uh, uh, the state parties in how they crafted it uh, was meant not to deviate from the provisions of the uh, WTO TBT annex, but make use of them and implement them and create even more uh, uh, provisions uh, that may facilitate in the implementation of the WTO TBT agreement. Now, there are a number of uh, um, uh, uh, fundamental principles uh, that connects uh, the two or that explicitly uh, show that um, they, um, uh, they come from the same uh, mindset or the same thinking. Uh, the TBT Annex applies uh, in the same manner uh, 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 on standards, technical regulations, conformity assessments, accreditation, and metrology. I will not go into the details of this because the previous presenters have already covered uh, all of this. And the intention really is trade facilitation through cooperation and elimination of uh, 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 TBTs um, through international be best practice and regulation, use of international standards, mutual recognition uh, arrangements, um, and also transparency. Now, uh, the, 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 the Article 3 of uh, Annex 6 also explicitly says that uh, state parties agree that the WTO activity agreements are formed the basis of the annex, uh, citing uh, 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 the guiding principles uh, as far as um, the TBT agreement uh, is concerned. Now, one of the uh, areas that uh, uh, the, TB, the, the TBT annex, the AFCFTA annex six on TBT uh, highlights specifically is uh, dependence on already existing then African quality infrastructure institutions. Um, so the intention, um, excuse me for the announcement, but um, the intention was not to create uh, new structures with the implementation of the AFCFTA agreement, but leverage on already existing institutions, such as, for instance, at the continental level, um, your Pan-African quality infrastructure, as uh, Margaret has already um, uh, highlighted in her presentation. So this forms the fundamental uh, basis also for the implementation. Uh, if, if you look at the, the annex, the annex uh, does not charge uh, in any way uh, the secretariat to develop any standards in any way, but speaks to state parties and also then speaks to um, the Pan-African quality infrastructure for the use of the uh, uh, harmonization of standards and also uh, international harmonization of uh, international uh, standards. So this is one of the key areas um, that uh, the annex highlights. I also want to say when I say this is is key actually and fundamental to the uh, the, the the spirit of the AFCFT agreement, which is developmental in nature. Uh, so we realize that it goes further in in its provisions, in specifically saying where there is no standard, uh, state parties will look to ASO uh, to develop uh, such standards where there is no uh, 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 there is no international standard or there is n there are no standards at all. So these um, uh, 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 institutions are, have been given uh, uh, some level of prominence in the um, AFCFTA uh, TBT Annex, which is not the case necessarily uh, at the level of the uh, WTO TBT agreement. Uh, now, one of the areas that I think we understand um, as we look at uh, the TBT Annex, I will not go to the details of every article, is that it is dependent on functioning quality infrastructure. And uh, it is always the hope that whatever uh, the PACI structures are doing and the national institutions are doing, understand that it is for the benefit of cross-border trade which is the whole mandate of the AFCFTA uh, agreement. So the intention really uh, uh, is to have um, the quality infrastructure at the level that it can serve the continent as far as uh, capacity is concerned, competence is concerned, and international recognition uh, is concerned. And we hope that even going forward, this has been ongoing, of course, for many years from different um, uh, 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 programs that have come in to different countries and with the understanding that in Africa we are at different levels of development. However, we know that 
even more now with the presence of the AFCFT agreement, more is required now for the institutions, um, uh, even now thinking about the stock stock taking, TBT stock taking document that Margaret spoke to earlier, uh, that there is need to further do more work in terms of giving our institutions uh, the ability uh, to function in order for us to implement the provisions of the uh, TBT agreement, the TBT annex. Um, I will uh, just uh, speak to this briefly. This uh, 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 in the in the facilitation of uh, 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 import and export trade. We believe uh, uh, within the annex. Uh, and the implementation thereof of the TBT that this make really critical. Of course, this is within uh, 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 the, 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 the various obligations of the annex, uh, but I also want to highlight in, in this uh, that uh, um, I think Sarah also spoke to the issue of transparency and also the issue of uh, non-tariff measures uh, data. Uh, this become very key uh, in the implementation of them uh, TBT Annex, and it has been highlighted as a priority uh, because we believe that information, where information is not available or is made available, uh, the private sector will not benefit from what the trade policy environment has created as far as the agreement is concerned. So this is why we've highlighted all of this as those that are really key uh, in the implementation of Annex 6 on uh, TBT. Now, to make the annex, uh, 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 we um, uh, we recently had um, a, a retreat at the AFCFT Secretariat uh, first. Usually, they take place at the beginning of the year. And one of the areas of importance that the Secretary General highlighted was the fact that we are now in the implementation phase. Uh, it must be understood that the institution uh, is only a few years old. Uh, and, and, and conclusion now of the negotiations has been, uh, you know, finalized with the uh, latest um, uh, protocols on women and youth and also the digital trade that have recently been uh, adopted uh, in, in February. But the most important emphasis is that we are now in the implementation phase. And in the implementation phase, the most important person that we need to uh, and make sure the argument speaks to is the private sector. And if we cannot make the private sector use what we have been negotiating on, that means we cannot leverage on the uh, uh, gains that uh, the, 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 the argument gives. So we now have a uh, focus on the private sector to make sure that there is first and foremost available information and there is also ability uh, to comply. And this will be uh, our focus in terms of capacitating SMEs and others to know that uh, 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 in the cross-border trade issues of standards, technical regulations and tariff measures, uh, the existence of them uh, 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 may not necessarily uh, be a problem, but how well can they be able to uh, comply and conform so that they don't become a problem? Um, I just want to highlight uh, this, uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, uh, in collaboration with Haki, uh, highlighting some of those areas. Uh, I'll speak to the subcommittee uh, on TBT, uh, also uh, uh, trying to draw experiences from um, uh, uh, the, the, the WTO TBT uh, SPS committee. Uh, we have convened so far in, in the three years of implementation, three uh, meetings of the subcommittee. We are still at the very early stages. And what we've been doing is trying to set up uh, systems that will make us move uh, with speed as far as uh, the implementation is concerned. However, uh, we've worked with uh, uh, the package structures, and this is why uh, you see the uh, MOUs uh, there as uh, a part of what, uh, the important work that we've been doing in terms of putting up uh, foundations, uh, working on the continental regulatory framework. This forms part of the work program of the TBT subcommittee, uh, uh, and, and this was already work being done by under PACI, and we felt it is important not to duplicate but also to just leverage on, on, on work that is ongoing. Other areas include um, uh, uh, the, 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 the agreement for mutual acceptance of conformity assessment results, which has also have been given prominence as far as this is concerned as part of uh, uh, areas of uh, critical um, concern that can be targeted 
um, uh, in early stages. Now, the other things that we've been doing, we've had the AFCFTA Business Forum, where we engaged um, the private sector, uh, also the Inter-Africa uh, Trade Fair. So you can tell um, in this, uh, uh, in this is for the last two years, and uh, we've only been in existence actually for, you know, three or four years. Uh, and this is uh, the area that we have been doing. And I also want to say that this also with the understanding that, uh, you know, capacity as far as human resources is, is concerned is only being built now. And, and this is... Uh, as far as uh, we can go. But we are hopeful that as the committee meets, that there will be more lessons learned that we can pick from the WTO uh, TBT committee in terms of addressing some of the issues. Now I'll speak briefly, even though he's not here, on the notification system. We have also work on ongoing uh, on the uh, notification system. We commissioned a study uh, at, the, at the level of the secretariat to do a learning um, on the EPIN system to see how well uh, the state parties are, 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 um, are, are notifying as far as the system is concerned and what we can pick such that with that information, we can see how well to address uh, the issues of transparency within uh, the system. The annex clearly, as Sarah said earlier, uh, uh, says use, uh, a state party says we must use existing systems already and not duplicate, you know, but so what we intend to do is how well are, are state parties noti notifying and uh, how well can we, you know, uh, try and bridge the gap where uh, others are notifying and it's only uh, others are notifying. So that study is ongoing. I, I did hear uh, uh, Ruben also um, uh, speak to it. Uh, so it has not yet been published, but we are still trying to uh, consult on it and get as much com uh, comments on it as we can before we take it to uh, the, the various subcommittees. Now uh, I'll, I'll move on uh, this one and then I'll go to the SPS. Um, uh, the SPS also is the same. Uh, if you look at the SPS uh, annex, it also specifically article three of it uh, says that it, it does not deviate from the uh, uh, WTO SPS agreement, but ensures that state parties uh, implement the SPS annex within um, uh, uh, confines of uh, the WTO, um, uh, within the guiding principles of the WTO uh, 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 SPS agreement. I am now uh, rushing, but I just want to go, um, uh, it focuses on all uh, the areas. I just wanted to come here as well <clears throat> to say as far as the SPS uh, uh, annex uh, on SPS is concerned, which is annex seven, it also recognizes <clears throat> that there are already bodies that we're working within the structure uh, within the SPS framework, uh, within the SPS field, like the uh, Inter-African Bureau for Animal Resources, AU IBA, AU uh, IPSAC as well, and um, uh, the uh, you know, the other standards are setting bodies. So the intention is to leverage on work that has already been going on. There is nothing that we are starting uh, afresh, but uh, we are now trying to say to our state parties, there is work that has been going on on the various obligations and, 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 uh, and uh, requirements in implementing the annex. But let us use the existing uh, work that, so that we are not starting afresh. So focus really is to say, um, uh, for instance, as far as food safety is concerned, um, what can we do now to assist uh, state parties, especially in those those that are in the cross-border trade, as far as SPS measures are concerned, to know what is existing in the countries and to be able to comply uh, 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 as far as uh, compliance, but also working with the uh, governments to try and harmonize and find uh, equivalence as far as the principles of the annex are concerned. I want to come uh, to this uh, end so that I end here. I'm just looking at my time. Uh, um, now the notification study I've already uh, uh, referred to. Uh, there's a number of training um, uh, and learning uh, events that have been conducted. And this is speaking to work that has been done already uh, and, and with, with all the other institutions that we've referred to. Um, also participation in the uh, AU SPS forum as part of working uh, together to implement um, the various SPS uh, obligations. I think one of the areas that we also, uh, that was also discussed is the issue of 
having a, a, a observer status of um, international or regional organizations within uh, the SPS um, uh, subcommittee. And this is work that is ongoing as far as uh, the SPS um, uh, implementation is concerned. So what I will say uh, as far as uh, uh, how well uh, the Annexes, Annex 7, I only spoke to Annex 6 and Annex 7. I didn't say anything on the NTB uh, 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 Annex. Uh, uh, that is okay because we are speaking SPS and TBT. Uh, is, is the fact that uh, we need the institutions uh, to be at the level, which is capacity building and technical competence, uh, where they are at a level where uh, there will be ease of interaction from uh, one country to another, the small and the big uh, countries. And also the most important that I will keep emphasizing is the issue of the private sector. This is where we are concerned. Now, above all of this, if we do not get our measures, our technical regulations and our standards harmonized or recognized equivalence uh, uh, in one way or another, it may not help uh, the private sector in any way to advance our uh, our course as far as implementation is concerned. Um, and in ending, I will say that we are still building. Um, uh, uh, we are building and we want to make a good foundation, at least for some of us that came in early. And we need to be able to build an institution uh, that will be able not to duplicate, repeat, or, 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 or not use resources optimally, but work with our stakeholders to ensure that the AFCFT agreement, as far as the areas on um, uh, a removal of uh, uh, TBT-related uh, barriers or, or restrictive SPS measures are concerned, can be done in a way that is efficient and that leverages on existing knowledge. Uh, whether from the African um, uh, institutions uh, relevant, as I said, PAKI and the other SPS related institutions, but also at the level uh, of the uh, international uh, institutions, such as the learnings uh, of the TBT and uh, SPS sub, uh, uh, committees uh, of, the, of the WTO. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I've been really running. I hope I've done due justice to the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Kwena. Uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, you have, we, oh, we have a lot of expectations uh, on the LCFTA secretariat. Mm -hmm. And you are at the steering wheel. So if we ask a lot of questions, you should know that we are very anxious and very optimistic that the LCFTA uh, will rise to the occasion and uh, really uh, help the continent achieve, you know, the aspirations that you find that we have postponed for a long time. How do we get there? So the question that I may want to put forward, because you have answered so those that were put down, I think we shouldn't have given you them earlier. So you have answered them within the framework of your presentation. So the question I would want to ask, now that we know that we have a lot of best practices, that are there. The WTO has worked very much to ensure that there is a streamlining of the way the SPS and the TBT agreements work uh, globally. So are there intentions within the LCFTA secretariat to leapfrog rather than trying to build from the very basics, to leapfrog right on what is already existing and for us to move forward faster? in yes. implementing this, yes. Yes, uh, I will just simply make um, a, a simple example. Uh, I, I spoke to the ACTRAV um, uh, a document, for instance, the technical regulatory uh, framework. Um, this was already work that had been uh, initiated prior uh, to us coming onto the scene, but uh, it has been accepted even at the level of the subcommittee on TBT uh, to say, let us uh, have this also implemented uh, and not start again uh, to say we are FCFT this side, uh, those are uh, Paki that side, but it is actually responding uh, to, actu the, to the actual needs of Article uh, 
uh, Article uh, 7 on technical regulations. Uh, so why, as far as good regulatory practice, uh, already adopt this? Uh, because it has already uh, been done. This is just one example where I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, making an example. Another one is on the harmonization of standards. Uh, is already, there's harm, if, um, standards that have been harmonized. And there was talk also within the subcommittee to say, uh, bring the standards that have been harmonized so that we, you know, we submit them uh, uh, even through the structures of the FCFT so that we know that uh, this work has been done already. There is no need to repeat any of this um, work that has been going. Uh, uh, I, I will leave it here and say any other questions that uh, come, I will be happy to respond to them uh, in the uh, uh, bilaterally or anyhow, my, my, my details can be shared uh, with the colleagues online. Yeah, thank you very much, Gwena, and uh, we appreciate your presentation, and we look thank forward you. to uh, more engagements uh, in these forums. Uh, thank you, thank and you. to you. Uh, thank uh, you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah, so uh, let me come to Derek Omar. Uh, this is from CARICOM, and uh, thank you, sir, for accepting to uh, to, to have Gwena present before you. You are scheduled to be number two because we understand she is running uh, to take a flight out. Uh, so um, in introduction, uh, Derek Omar is the chief executive, CARICOM Regional Organization for Standardization. Uh, they call it cross uh, is the is the organization that is equivalent to ARSO uh, but in the Caribbean. Uh, they are headquartered in uh, uh, Barbados. cross is the regional quality infrastructure a development institution founded by the 15 member states of the Caribbean uh, community. Uh, Omar is focusing on modernizing and accelerating the preparation, adoption, and application of regional standards, methodology, accreditation, and conformity assessment uh, systems to increase trade, boost industrial efficiency and effectiveness, advance quality consciousness culture among citizens, and further the course of the CARICOM single market and economy. He was past chief executive of the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards and past director of export at Trinidad and Tobago and occupational health and safety uh, agency of Trinidad and Tobago. And then uh, the COPAN, the Pan American Standards uh, Organization and STM International. Uh, we have interacted with Derek Komar uh, as Ariso. And we believe that they share a lot of uh, aspirations with also. And uh, we really welcome you, Asa, to uh, share experiences uh, with us uh, on the insights for Africa from what you are doing at Crosby. Uh, welcome, Derek Kumar. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just trying to open up my presentation. Uh, just bear with me one second. Right. Okay, cool. So I gather everybody is seeing this. Thanks very much for that, Ruben. So the title of the presentation from the Caribbean is the quest for good regulatory practice, harmonization and regulatory cooperation in the Caribbean community or CARICOM, insights for Africa and the cross queues approach. So for those who don't know, um, CARICOM comprises 15 member states of the islands of the Caribbean, and we are currently based in Barbados. And that's a map of our spread of regional member states. So operationally, CrossQ is the cooperative network of the 15 national standard bodies of the member states of what is called by the revised Treaty of Chagramas, the Caribbean Community or CARICOM. And CARICOM strives for single market and economy. So CrossQ harmonizes standards and TVT related technical regulations to help grow the CARICOM single market and economy. We 
try to ensure transparency and stakeholder consultation in the development and promulgation of standards and technical regulations. And we promote the mutual recognition of conformity assessment procedures across trading nations, inspection, testing, certifications. And we actively try to promote the value of quality competitiveness and quality infrastructure to anybody who will listen. So CrossQ is really a full service um, quality infrastructure development regional institution in that we try to work on harmonizing standards, technical regulations, um, accreditation and conformity assessment systems across the region with the 15 bureaus of standards being the representative bodies and the agencies we work through. So metrology is also part of our developmental agenda. And we have a technical officer in each of these uh, six pillars of quality infrastructure. So cross queues insights in terms of TBT challenges in our regions or, or rather learnings. Um, one is that we continually to suggest that you regulate only where necessary and think outside the box as to other opportunities that might be available, such as advertising, education, using the market forces, developing and using voluntary standards, use market incentives, encourage industries to self-regulate, you know, before you jump into prescriptive regulations. And this will help to reduce the regulatory burdens on all parties, find an alternate best policy options, as just mentioned, to technical regulations where possible, and maintain adequate levels of protection, but do not overregulate. So that's, that's one of the areas we preach about, regulate only when necessary. We also preach about the need to strive for international and regional harmonization in good regulatory practices and make appropriate use to member states. So we follow the insights and the recommendations of the WTO TBT committee and also the OECD model on good regulatory practices and we encourage member states to use it. Um, in terms of regulate only necessary, we find that the ministries, they jump straight into regulation and don't think about other policy options. And when they jump into technical regulations, they don't often follow international good practices of how you develop that technical regulation. And even when they try to, they try to follow it too rigidly and they don't make it appropriate to their, to their needs and requirements. And these are some of the shortfalls we think that they are there in technical regulations development. The other thing is we, we promote that they should keep legislative, legislation simple and homogeneous and try to keep the approach to good regulatory practice consistent across all ministries. Enforced by means of effective and proportionate surveillance, which means that when you do market surveillance, help the people to comply to the technical regulations and therefore don't use it as a witch hunt or a tool to be punitive on people help them to learn how to comply with the regulations and seek market feedback from the same users that the regulations to upgrade it. But then that brings us to the last problem. We don't take a life cycle approach to technical regulations. We don't monitor, we don't review. We don't deregulate or re-regulate more efficiently where possible. And therefore what goes into effect stays in effect forever and ever. So these are some of the TBT challenges we see in the region um, that we have to deal with. And we try to find ways and means to help the member states deal with these things. I'm sure it's almost the same in, in Africa because it's just human nature. You have a problem, solve it. Solve it, put in place a technical regulation because everybody will listen to. Okay, on to next problem and forget what we just did. Right, and that's a behavioral problem of the human consciousness. So key initiatives that CrossQ has used to help with good regulatory practice, promotion, development, and application in the region. 
So this is the WTO TBT Committee General Model of Good Regulatory Practice. And I believe it's very well aligned to the OECD model and things like that, you know, prepare for technical regulation, adopt it, apply it, publish early internationally um, of the need for regulatory activity, publish your drafts early, do a RIA, consult, then adopt, enter into force, notify the WTO review as you go along. However, what we have found is that the problem with that model is that our people, they just jump straight from a problem into a technical regulation. So what CrossQ came up with um, through two projects back to back with the same consultants is that we developed a model that we call CrossQ's state intervention and analysis model to good regulatory practice. Step one is to make initial considerations of what the problem is. Step two is to define the problem structure. So you can see all elements of the problem. Step, step two, sorry, after that step one is to assess policy alternatives to help solve the bigger structure of the problem. For one alternative is to do nothing. The other one is to advertise, educate people to comply or to better themselves. The third one is to find ways and means to use market forces to help people um, um, be more productively better. The other one is to help people understand the value of their bureaus of standards, um, their metrology institutions, their conformity assessment institutions, and develop and use voluntary standards and conformity assessment assessment practices. Another policy option in a hierarchy then would be if those things don't work, look at market incentives or disincentives to help the market conform. And then you can move on to self-regulation and voluntary codes of practices. And then finally, after you do all that documentation and, consult and consult consultation, which is step three, then you make a step four decision way forward. And after you've gone through all those policy options, if none of them are pros, cons, working out in the direction you want to go, then your last decision making in step four would be to do a technical regulation. And then if you do a technical regulation, you move to step five, which is going through the WTO TBT committee, um, beautiful agenda of how to do that as just shown. And then step six, don't forget to monitor and review. So basically we came up with this state intervention analysis model of how to do good regulatory practices in the CARICOM region that CrossQ tries to promote. And we have codified this model into a, a really nice document I'll show you shortly. So what we're saying is before you jump to technical regulations, you know, take a moment to really think through the structure of the problem and think through a series of solutions before you come to need a technical regulation. Don't jump from a problem straight to technical regulations. So that's what we try to encourage. And this is the documents we developed. The first document is called a Regional Good Regulatory Practice Guide and a National Code of Practice on GRP. So what we developed was a document at the regional level that spells out the model that you just saw there, the SIA model, including the WTO um, practices of, of GRP. And we spelled it out in a very stepwise, clause by clause, principle-based guide of how to do good regulatory practice at the regional level. But then we said, well, how do we get a member state to adopt this? So what we did is we took every single principle-based clause of the good regulatory practice based upon the SIA model. We wrote it out, and then we wrote a parallel um, national clause that if you were to implement this principle, what would it say and what would it look like? And when we wrote out these parallel clause by clauses of the regional guide, we call this a national code of practice. So that if you take this national code of practice 
and fill in the blank spaces that we left out um, to customize it to your needs, then essentially what you have is a regional good regulatory practice guide based upon international principles and added to which a pre-customization elements of how to think through problems and look at policy options before we come to TRs. And then take that guide now and transfer it into a national code of practice. So at the end of the day, you just focus on your national code of practice, customize to your needs, and you share that with all your ministries. And to help people understand this regional good practice guide and the national code of practice, that conversion from the regional guide to a national code of practice, we also developed a good regulatory practice workbook. So like I said, in the national code of practice, you would see clauses that reflect the regional guide. And what we will do to help fill in the blank spaces on the national code of practice, we have questions and templates in the workbook that if you fill it out, you will get the answers as to what to put in your code of practice. So in terms of the good regulatory practice and the national code of practice guide, this is how it looks like. On the objectives and scope on the left-hand side, you will see what is the objective and scope of the regional guide. On the right-hand side, you will see what is the objectives and scope of the code of practice. And as you see, the concepts are the same, but in certain places, we leave a red blank for you to fill out. So that through the workbook, we will teach you how to fill in all the red spaces on the right-hand side. And once you do that, then your code of good regulatory practice will be mapped to the regional guide that will harmonize everybody. And the model is the SIA, State Intervention Analysis, including the technical regulations process. And in this way, we hope to overcome all the challenges that we had pointed out. So the good regulatory practice workbook that will help you fill out all those red spaces in the national code, it has you know, different um, definitions of what each of the opportunities in the various clauses means. And then it has templates you can fill out um, to help you unearth the answers that you would want to push in your national code of practice. So the way forward for CrossQ is that we actually have two major EU programs um, coming in 24 and 25, and possibly also with the IDB and USAID to support the rollout of CrossQ's regional GRP guide and model national code of practice for customization in each member state. So this year, we hope to go into three member states, aggregate some stakeholders, and help them develop their national code of practice using the workbook system to fill in the red blanks. And when we pull out, they will now have a national code of practice and good regulatory practice that helps them to think through problems. And if they reach technical regulations, how to follow the WTO recommended processes. Um, and we will do about three or four member states, hopefully this year and do another three or four next year. And that way, these national codes of practices will be linked to the regional guide. And that way you get some sort of harmonization across the region. And then we will share the documents, roll out the methodology and learnings for other de development countries to try and also evolve, starting with the document that is currently available on CrossQ's website. Because we think our problem in the developing world, we jump straight from our problem to a technical regulation and forget that there are other solutions out there. And that's because we don't structure the problem upfront. Um, and this document is supposed to help us do that now. So that's what we're trying to practice from CrossQ in the region to help our member states during the next couple of years develop a national code of practice on good GRP, customized to their needs and developing world context, but that is very much linked to the international agenda on GRP. Thanks very much. Yeah, th thank you very much, Derek uh, Omar. And when I look at the way you presented it, uh, perhaps for us, it will form a very important approach once we have the African Continental Technical Regulations 
uh, framework in place for us to move to the next step of using your approach towards having the member states adapt or ad domesticate uh, that in a way that looks very easy and very clear. But a question here, and uh, what you mentioned about the ministers, governments uh, coming up with uh, you know technical regulations to address issues. One of the most um, prevalent issues in developing countries is for member states to think that they could come up with a, a regulation uh, that blocks imports of products from the other countries so that they offer their, their relevant sector an opportunity to grow. I don't know whether you have encountered such things and how you have addressed them. So for example, if it is the import of sugar, they will impose some kind of regulations uh, to say that we will stop importing sugar so that uh, our sector can also grow and compete. Have you had such ca cases and uh, how have you tackled these kinds of uh, you know, uh, regulations? Thanks very much. So, you know, that, that again is a human nature problem. So it exists everywhere in the world. <laughs> and by rolling out these two documents during the course of this year and next year to help member states now develop the national code of practice and good GRP, and that will be aligned, even though they'll be customized, they'll be lined to the regional guide and that is linked to the international guides on it. We believe that that process will help to start curbing that kind of protectionist issue that tends to occur. Now, right now on the ground, the bureaus of standards work closely with their, um, their ministries of trade and agricultural development so that when, when issues like what you're mentioning are spotted or people complain during the inquiry point, either on SPS or TBT, the bureaus, they get involved with the ministries and try to educate and sort out this issue so that they, we move to equal treatment of imports and in-country production. So it's a stepwise approach to, to developmental agendas and we work in towards free trade development through education, getting involved, helping to resolve disputes when we see they arising and those kinds of things. And also too, by switching from say, technical regulations to higher quality national standards, you know, that also helps the process to of equality to develop and grow. Thanks. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, we will come back to you um, before we close the the session um, and there are quite a lot of things to share. And I think uh, in good time, we shall be having the necessary opportunities to share more so that we see how we tackle some of these common problems that affect uh, our respective regions. Uh, I will take this opportunity to welcome our next uh, uh, presenter. I will be the last presenter today. Uh, this is Trudy Hasenberg and she's the executive director uh, trade law center, which we call TRALAC. And uh, she will be handling these aspects of SPS, agreement, SPS and TBT agreements, legal institutions, disciplines, and framework and implications for LCFTA, SPS committees, legal framework in support of regulatory quality, uh, trade policy, and dispute resolution. Uh, we recognize the special role that uh, TRALAC plays in highlighting some of the legal issues that go with the, you know, the, the integration at the continental level. And we uh, wish to benefit a lot from your perspectives and your views uh, in respect of the operations of the FCFT, TBT and SPS committees and the way forward in terms of ensuring that we can have a coherent uh, stru structure that promotes the aspirations of free movement of goods uh, in the continent. Uh, welcome to it uh, for your presentation. Uh, you can unmute. I still see that you're muted. Uh, Dan, you can help to unmute Trudy.
Okay, there you go. Thank you so much, Ruben, for the kind invitation. Good afternoon, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to join you. As Ruben has indicated, Trilac works on a broad range of trade issues. I have to admit that I've really enjoyed listening to the experts on SPS and TBT. I am neither. And so I will share with you a perspective from the AFCFTA, a broad trade um, policy and governance perspective. And I think it is useful to take a step back to reiterate some of the issues that our colleagues have mentioned already. First of all, SBS and TBT are important disciplines in every trade governance framework. And of course, we find particular focus in the annexes to the protocol on trade and goods in the African continental free trade area. We are not starting from scratch colleagues. Most of the state parties and the non-state parties that will also be joining the African continental free trade area are members of the World Trade Organization at the recent ministerial conference, we gained an additional African member into the WTO community as Comoros became accepted, its accession was finalized. So we're starting from a basis of multilateral governance on sanitary phytosanitary measures, on technical barriers to trade, where we look at standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, and so on. There is also an existing institutional architecture as African WTO member states have been implementing their commitments under the WTO agreements on SBS and TBT and more broadly in that broad collection of legal instruments of the World Trade Organization. But at regional economic community level, a great deal of work has also been done and there has been some reference to the East African community where regional standards, for example, have been developed and several hundred um, common standards have now been adopted. But on the continent, there is significant asymmetry. So there are some countries that have deep institutional capacity and experience, and there are others which may need assistance. And we see this asymmetry, the, the broad challenges of bringing together a group of unequal partners across the African continent reflected in the detail of the annexes, Annex 6 on TBT, Annex 7 on SPS. We're looking here also at Annex 5 on non-tariff barriers, and McQuenna shared some details there with us as well. It's a reminder, and I'm an economist, so this is very important for me, that SPS and TBT have legitimate public policy objectives. They are implemented not in and of themselves, but to achieve broader development outcomes. And I think this is extremely important to keep in mind. So we are introducing measures, adopting measures, and regulation in the public interest based on good practice, international best practice, following good governance principles. And that's really important. In the context of the African continental free trade area, colleagues, what is important to keep in mind is that this is a very ambitious project and it has very, very ambitious development objectives. And it's in this context that I'm going to take a look at SPS, TBT and the non-tariff barriers. We're not only aiming to create a continental market for goods and services, and of course now for the digital economy as well as we've adopted a new protocol fairly recently. But the aim is also to enhance competitiveness and promote structural transformation of our economies and markets. And very specifically, one of the objectives focuses on promoting industrial development. This is all consonant with the broad development objectives of the African Union Agenda 2063, where we have, and I think this is so important as we've discussed this afternoon, complementary policies, initiatives, 
institutions which are particularly important in terms of promoting best practice and development of forward-looking approaches, good regulatory practice when it comes to S SPS and TBT. So Parkey and other institutions exist. They create enormous value in the space that we're talking about. I've been asked to say a little bit about SPS and TBT in the context of the African continental free trade area with reference also to dispute settlement. And colleagues, this is an overview of the legal framework of the African continental free trade area. As you will see, it consists of an agreement establishing the African continental free trade area. And therein already are references to the matters at hand today, amongst, of course, many others. Then we have specific protocols, protocol on trade and goods, and it is in the annexes to the protocol on trade and goods that, of course, we find the technical details. This is particularly important for implementation of the African continental free trade area, and this is where we find the annexes that we're discussing this afternoon non-tariff barriers, Annex 5, sanitary fighter, sanitary measures, technical barriers to trade. And then there are other protocols, a specific protocol on dispute settlement, and I'll say a little bit about that. It's also important to keep in mind that there are other protocols on trade-related issues such as investment, and the attraction of investment to broaden and diversify our industrial capacity, for example, is particularly important. Standards, SPS measures, and so on are relevant for our investors as well. Intellectual property rights, and I think this is a connection too to the conversation, particularly as relates to, for example, the development of the annexes to the protocol on intellectual property rights, where issues such as plant breeder rights, for example, but also the protection of innovation, for example, through patents, through utility models, um, and others, which are also connected to the broader TBT arena. So there are many cross-references that we must keep in mind. The protocol on trade and goods actually has nine annexes. And this is extremely important because we are now finalizing the negotiations. In fact, quite recently, the guidelines on the implementation of trade remedies were, were adopted. But as we've also heard from our colleagues, there is now work to facilitate the implementation of specific annexes, such as the ones we're discussing here. But in addition to that, colleagues, the African continental free trade area has been adopted as a framework for Africa's industrialization. And it is in this context that what we're talking about today is particularly relevant. If we take a look at the priority sectors that have been identified in this very important initiative, agribusiness, the automotive sector, transport logistics, pharmaceuticals and many, many others have been identified. What we're discussing today is particularly important if we want to develop and diversify the industrial capacity on the continent, and that we must do. We need to keep in mind that there are 33 least developed countries with very little value added productive capacity existing at the moment. They want to industrialize. And with that comes building the quality infrastructure, building the science and the institutions which can support an effective regulatory infrastructure as far as SPS and TBT are concerned. Within the African continental free trade area, the right to regulate is enshrined. And we find this repeated in a number of the legal instruments. In other words, domestic regulation is particularly important also in the context that we're discussing. The AFCFTA technical regulatory framework, which is under construction, we're in the early phases, is part of the implementation of this quality and regulatory infrastructure that is our subject for today. 
Elimination of non-tariff barriers enjoys high priority under the AFCFDA because it is well documented that the non-tariff barriers are far more pernicious barriers to intra-Africa trade than the tariff barriers. In fact, the average ad valorem equivalent of the non-tariff barriers, for example, that impact agricultural trade on the continent are well over 300%. So the non-tariff barriers really, if translated into a tariff, would, would allow us to, to reckon with the reality um, of a barrier of in excess of 300% as, as a tariff measure. And this is particularly important so that the Annex 5 has established a mechanism for the monitoring, the reporting, and the elimination of non-tariff barriers. Now, colleagues, this relates to some extent also, of course, to how we resolve challenges. And therefore, it is linked also to a discussion around dispute settlement. And I'll say more about that in a minute. This is the monitoring, reporting, and elimination mechanism. It is a portal which is open although full trade under the AFCFDA does not happen yet. And if we take a look at, this is just the first page from that portal, we immediately see that there are collections of non-tariff barriers which predominate, whether we take a look at reporting of NTBs at regional or continental level. And among them, are in fact SPS and TBT issues, and then customs and border management issues are the other very important and very prevalent um, category. So we see here as one of the first complaints that is registered on the AFC FDA portal for reporting NTBs is conformity assessment. And this involves a matter between Cameroon and Chad. The details are available there, and I think studying these developments are particularly important because we see how these non-tariff tariff barriers that are linked in this case to TBT issues manifest. Are they related to substantive or procedural issues? So the complaints very, very often focus on administrative, administrative law due process issues. And this means that we really have to take a look at the administration, the actual implementation of the measures and the standards at national and increasingly at regional continent level. We already have other NTB elimination portals and mechanisms that have been established. There are ones in West Africa and East and Southern Africa. And this is a reminder again that the regional economic community free trade areas are the building blocks of the AFCFDA. So taking a look at what exists already at the regional level provides not only lessons for what we can do at the AFCFDA, but is taken into account in terms of the policy, legal and institutional architecture of continental trade in Africa. So here again, this is one of the complaints that was logged. This is tradebarriers.org. This is the portal for East and Southern Africa introduced under the tripartite initiative. And here again, we see one of the complaints relating to conformity assessment. So colleagues, this is the reality that our traders, our investors, our producers experience, and there are important lessons. I won't go through any of the details of, of the annexes because our colleagues have done that, save to note that there is very, very important emphasis on enhanced cooperation and transparency. And I'll come back to this. Sarah has addressed this already earlier on. Enhancing technical capacity of state parties for the implementation and monitoring of SPS measures while encouraging the use of international standards in the elimination of barriers to trade. Very sensible, practical, pragmatic approach adopted in Annex 7 on, on SBS. And this will mean that there will be, there will have to be 
a great deal of emphasis on capacity building, information sharing, experience sharing. And it's just a reminder, if we take a look at Annex, Annex 7 in, in detail, that we are really looking at best practice. We're looking at good governance principles, consultations, cooperation, and capacity building are absolutely critical. If we look at the Annex 6 on technical barriers to trade, again, we find reference to cooperation in the areas of standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, accreditation, metrology, as McQueen has reminded us, elimination of unnecessary and unjustifiable technical barriers to trade. So this is really where we go back to Occam's razor, necessary regulation effectively implemented following best regulatory practice as Derek has reminded us. Strengthening cooperation, identification of priorities, absolutely critical. As I've mentioned, the annexes also establish institutions, the subcommittees for technical barriers to, to trade. And I'm going to skip through in the interest of time just to say a little bit about these institutions. Colleagues, this is the institutional architecture of the African continental free trade area. The apex body is the assembly. This is the assembly of the African Union. Legal instruments are adopted there. Key decisions are taken by our heads of state and government in the AU Assembly. Council of Ministers, the most senior body, decision-making body of the AFCFDA, Committee of Senior Trade Officials. They've been doing a lot of hard work on the negotiations. Here is the dispute settlement body. And as you'll see, colleagues, it is modeled on the WTO system as much of the AFCFDA actually is with a panel system and an appellate body. We have changed some of the provisions so that we don't have the kind of gridlock situation we currently have in dispute settlement at the WTO. The AFCFDA secretariat is the only permanent institution. That's very important to keep in mind. So a lot rests on the shoulders of our colleagues at the AFCFDA Secretariat. For our discussion, colleagues, we go down to the committees on trade in goods, trade and services, investment, competition policy, intellectual property rights, digital trade, and women and youth in trade. And let's follow the committee on trade in goods. There are a number of subsidiary committees, the subcommittees, on rules of origin, trade remedies, here they come, technical barriers to trade, non-tariff barriers, and SBS. The connection between SBS, TBT, and non-tariff barriers is very explicit. And I think this is a very pragmatic approach. Now, what do these committees do and who are they? I have noted again, they are not permanent institution. So they meet on occasion as may be determined by the state parties. Annex six and seven, they provide for the establishment of these committees. And on the right hand side, we have Annex six, article 13, which establishes the subcommittee on technical barriers to trade. Very briefly, among the functions of that subcommittee are cooperate and consult on standards, develop procedures for implementation of provisions of this annex, which they are already doing, identify areas for collaboration in the relevant infrastructure, the support standards, technical regulations, and so on, promote cooperation among the state parties, and very important, identify the capacity gaps and develop and implement capacity building programs. This is so, so important. Coordinate where appropriate the adoption of common positions among state parties on the WTO, TBT committee and other relevant international organizations. We have on the left-hand side, colleagues, very similar provisions. And this relates to the subcommittee for SPS. And if we take a look at the, the functions here to monitor and review implementation, provide direction for the identification, prioritization, management, 
and res resolution of SPS issues, provide a regular forum for information exchange relating to parties, regulatory systems, including scientific risk assessment, and many more. But these are officials and colleagues, some of you who are here with us today obviously sit on this committee. It is so important that we develop a community through these committee structures and that we keep the community developing and learning, not only from one another, but also as we're doing this afternoon from other regions across the world and from the World Trade Organization. But consistency in terms of participation and facilitation of participation in the face of some constraints that particularly our least developed countries may face is going to be a very important challenge for us to meet. Finally, I'd like to say a little bit about transparency, and this is absolutely critical. As soon as we introduce any forms of regulation, intervention, and any kind of compliance requirements, then transparency becomes extremely important. The private sector, which will drive the success of the African continental free trade area, of course, needs transparency, predictability, a legitimate legal framework, and having a predictable, transparent, and legitimate SPS and TBT framework is part of that as well. Now, the African continental free trade area places a lot of emphasis on transparency colleagues. And this comes from the founding agreement, the agreement establishing the AFCFDA. Part four is dedicated to transparency. And here there are general requirements for notification and laws, regulations, procedures, administrative rulings of general application, as well as any other commitments under an international agreement relating to any trade matter covered by this agreement adopted after entry into force of the agreement shall be notified by the state parties in one of the African Union working languages um, to other state parties through the Secretariat. So here you see the broad notification and publication requirements of the AFCFDA are via the Secretariat. So there is a broad commitment that is already undertaken. Publication, each state party shall promptly publish or make publicly available through accessible mediums, its laws, regulations, procedures, administrative rulings, and so on. So these are in addition to what we find in terms of the transparency provisions of Annexes 6 and 7. So there is emphasis, and I think this is really important. Sarah has already referred um, colleagues to notifications in the WTO, and I had a look at some of those in preparation for this. And we certainly see that some countries although they may have started rather slowly in terms of, of making notifications as they are required in the WTO, some of them are doing exceptionally well. We do see, and, and I think this is, is quite an important trend, more notifications of TBT than SPS for, for many, many countries now. The EP alert, EPing alert system, extremely important. This brings together a number of important institutions, trade-related institutions, also capacity-building institutions, extremely important. And this portal provides an important window for the private sector, but is also so important that we use this in order to make sure that we regularly and appropriately notify um, as we are required. So here are just a few countries. Um, I've noted the East African countries. Of course, there's a lot of a convergence, mutual recognition, and so on that, that is working very well in this, in this area. But other countries are doing um, their part in terms of notification as well. Now we will have also 
and AFCFDA or continental um, processes and portals for notification. And this, in terms of good governance, extremely important for us to have a look at how we can support the broader developments of the African continental free trade area, keeping in mind that SPS and TBT issues are, in a sense, the new frontiers of market access. If our products do not meet those requirements, then market access is denied. There's no negotiability. When it comes to tariffs, in many cases, we've seen the tariffs come down over the years. So tariffs for many of our trading relationships are less onerous than they used to be in the past. Arguably, if we look at SPS measures, technical regulations, standards, and so on, they may be becoming more onerous, particularly for the small and medium enterprises that are predominant as the engines of economic growth on the continent. So there's a great deal of work that we do need to do as far as that is concerned. Thank you so much, Ruben. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Trudy. And um, yeah, very insightful presentation. And uh, as you mentioned, these two uh, annexes deal with matters that are legitimate uh, in terms of their legitimate measures for member states uh, to, to, to take care of their populations. Now, I want to ask you, it's related to the question, of course, that we have, but I also want to ask you a very simple question. We have learned what works. Uh, for example, we, we do have the template of the what has worked in the European Union, uh, those issues of uh, the directives, the mutual recognition, um, you know, uh, approximating the laws. Um, a lot of things have happened. They have case laws that we can even learn from. Are we able in the African context to selectively transpose some of those good practices in our continent, in the context of the FCFT agreement and expect that they will work? Ruben, I think this is an extremely um, important question. Of course, when it comes to to regulation and science-based measures implement in order, implement in order to assure, for example, food safety, to protect human health and so on, then we really do look to, to international best practice and there's a great deal we can learn. But we also have to keep in mind that our policy, legal and institutional arrangements on the continent differ quite markedly from many of, of those in the international community, but they also differ amongst ourselves. We do not all have the legal systems and therefore not, not an, an identical approach to domestic regulation, for example, and, and the promulgation of decrees is still common in certain parts of the country. So I think this is, is particularly important, but there are processes underway and we've seen, for example, in terms of harmonizing commercial laws and regulations through the OHADA system in West Africa, this has really brought a lot of common practice and frameworks, which makes this a lot easier. But I think we also have to reckon with the fact that in developed regions like the European Union, the boundaries in terms of, of the topics that we're talking about, standards and technical regulations, just as one example, are becoming more and more concerned about issues such as climate, the environment, and tech. And the issues, for example, for many of our smaller scale ex exporters who are exporting agriculture, agri-process products, they will be facing new challenges related, for example, to packaging and labeling which are driven by environmental imperatives, mm -hmm. policy imperatives that those countries have. And these may well become effective non-tariff barriers. So I think engaging with our global trade partners is extremely important here as well. Some countries on the continent, for example, have economic partnerships with the European Union, and there is scope for capacity building and, and consultations and, and so on. So uh, those kind of issues, I think, become extremely important for us to pursue. 
So there's there's a list, a to-do list that I think we need to have a look at in order to make sure that we are taking on board not only this very ambitious initiative on the continent, but keep in mind that most of Africa's trade is still with global partners. So of necessity, we are looking at, at what is happening in terms of international best practice, but also specifically with, within the communities of regulatory practice in, in some of, of the developed country partners that we trade with. Thank you. And I would like you to be the first to give us your closing remarks, just 30 seconds. Ruben, thanks so much. I think, uh, colleagues, the African continental free trade area and the regimes for SPS and TBT that we are crafting together, building on the institutional policy and legal infrastructure that exists already, is extremely important. But this area, from my perspective, is absolutely critical for Africa's economic transformation and for our industrialization agenda. And we should make sure that the benefits to the private sector become accessible. So transparency, access to information, access to advice is particularly important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Derek, if you can give us your closing remarks. And you know uh, the, the last message that you can give uh, to the audience. The thanks very much. The last message is don't give up on trying to do technical regulations the proper way. It's a developmental curve that you really have to climb, and it requires a lot of education and patience. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we know we are. It's not the last time we are going to engage with you. Quite a long journey we are going to have. Yes. Plus your last remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh, I can't help but re-emphasize that it's important to build on existing mechanisms, procedures, and tools available to you and customize and um, build on them where necessary. Do sign up on EPING if you're in following SPS and TBT okay. issues and promote it with those around you both to monitor developments globally, because again, a lot of African exports are still going uh, abroad, outside beyond the continent, but also follow what you're, if you're in West Africa, you can see what the East Africans are doing by tracking yes. them on EPING. So you don't, you can already ha have the information there. And of course, through more compliance from Africa, it will give a, even a fuller picture. And lastly, Keep connected to the WTO's SPS and TBT committees uh, to track evolving discussions, practices, adopt the good practices back home, and most importantly, make the voice of Africa heard more loudly, because I don't think uh, we are hearing it enough in the committees. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. And I hope everyone is listening. Our voice needs to be heard. Um, Margaret. I hope, I don't know whether Quena will be able to connect. If she doesn't, you'll need to give us last, uh, closing remarks covering both. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ruben and everyone on, on this call. My last words, I think, to everyone, to all of us, actually, is that we have a big market, you know, with the agreement that is in place that is operational, we have an opportunity to grow our trade. Yes. But I'm also sure that some people have experienced challenges and now they understand that they cannot export their products if they do not meet requirements, if they do not conform to technical regulations. And therefore, the support of the quiet infrastructure institution becomes very, very important. And using the information that is available from the PACI, I think our call is look at what you have in place. Don't be reluctant. Build your quality QI institutions so that you can better support the implementation of TPT and SPS measures. Because if you can't measure those, it will be very difficult to actually participate in global trade, let alone intra-Africa trade. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. Uh, if you can't go, 
comply with standard technical regulations, SPS measures, all of that. You can't even trade at the national level. So um, it's quite limiting. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I think uh, um, uh, we, we've covered quite a lot. We've even overshot the time that was given. Just a response to one of the uh, comments I've seen that uh, as a webinar, sometimes because of the time limitation, we may not discuss a lot about what we are presenting, but we also give an opportunity for you to send in your comments, your views, your questions uh, after the web webinar is over so that you're able, you're able to, uh, to, to respond to them and the panelists can even respond to them directly uh, so that everybody gets to benefit from any answers or questions that you may be having. So as we close, it's um just to highlight that uh, uh, we shall be having um, our next uh, webinar on 24th uh, of April um, uh, of um, uh, this year. And in that, the theme will be standards and technical regulations as non-tariff barriers to trade. Um, so we look forward to, you know, we will circulate the title early enough so that if there are questions, we can always have the questions much earlier. Uh, just a reminder also that the 30th uh, ASO General Assembly will take place uh, in Abuja, uh, Nigeria, and we expect it to take place from uh, 17th to 21st June uh, 2024. Um, unless uh, from the uh, office we have any issues uh, to highlight, uh, Philip, if there is nothing uh, we can call uh, this uh, webinar uh, uh, to, 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 you know, uh, close uh, today and thank all the participants and the panelists uh, who participated, please send your questions to us and we will respond to them. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation. Our webinar is closed for today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Prosper. Hello, Suleiman. Hello, Amadu. Thank you so much. Hello, my friend. <laughs> Hello, Shroff. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>